Joseph Priestley FRS was an 18th-century English theologian, dissenting clergyman, natural philosopher, chemist, educator, and liberal political theorist who published over 150 works. He is usually credited with the discovery of oxygen, having isolated it in its gaseous state. Although Carl Wilhelm Scheele and Antoine Lavoisier also have a claim to the discovery. During his lifetime, Priestley's considerable scientific reputation rested on his invention of soda water, his writings on electricity, and his discovery of several airs, the most famous being what Priestley dubbed death logisticated air. However, Priestley's determination to defend phlogiston theory and to reject what would become the chemical revolution eventually left him isolated within the scientific community. Priestley's science was integral to his theology, and he consistently tried to fuse Enlightenment rationalism with Christian theism. In his metaphysical texts, Priestley attempted to combine theism, materialism, and determinism, a project that has been called audacious and original. He believed that a proper understanding of the natural world would promote human progress and eventually bring about the Christian millennium. Priestley, who strongly believed in the free and open exchange of ideas, advocated toleration and equal rights for religious dissenters which also led him to help found Unitarianism in England. The controversial nature of Priestley's publications combined with his outspoken support of the French Revolution aroused public and governmental suspicion. He was eventually forced to flee, in 1791, first to London, and then to the United States, after a mob burned down his home and church. He spent the last ten years of his life living in Northumberland County, Pennsylvania. A scholar and teacher throughout his life, Priestley also made significant contributions to pedagogy, including the publication of a seminal work on English grammar, books on history, and he prepared some of the most influential early timelines. These educational writings were some of Priestley's most popular works. It was his metaphysical works, however, that had the most lasting influence. Leading philosophers including Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, and Herbert Spencer credit him among the primary sources for utilitarianism. Early Life and Education Priestley was born to an established English dissenting family in Nurstall, near Batley in the West Riding of Yorkshire. He was the oldest of six children born to Mary Swift and Jonas Priestley, a finisher of cloth. To ease his mother's burdens, Priestley was sent to live with his grandfather around the age of one. He returned home, five years later, after his mother died. When his father remarried in 1741, Priestley went to live with his aunt and uncle, the wealthy and childless Sarah and John Keithley, three miles from Fieldhead. Because Priestley was precocious, at the age of four he could flawlessly recite all 107 questions and answers of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. His aunt sought the best education for the boy, intending him for the ministry. During his youth, Priestley attended local schools where he learned Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Around 1749, Priestley became seriously ill and believed he was dying. Raised as a devout Calvinist, he believed a conversion experience was necessary for salvation, but doubted he had had one. This emotional distress eventually led him to question his theological upbringing, causing him to reject election and to accept universal salvation. As a result, the elders of his home church, the independent upper chapel of Heckmund Wyck, refused him admission as a full member. Priestley's illness left him with a permanent stutter and he gave up any thoughts of entering the ministry at that time. In preparation for joining a relative in trade in Lisbon, he studied French, Italian, and German in addition to Aramaic and Arabic. He was tutored by the Reverend George Haggerston, who first introduced him to higher mathematics, natural philosophy, logic, and metaphysics through the works of Isaac Watts, Willem S. Graves Sander, and John Locke. Daventry Academy Priestley eventually decided to return to his theological studies in, in 1752, matriculated at Daventry, a dissenting academy. 
Because he had already read widely, Priestley was allowed to skip the first two years of coursework. He continued his intense study. This, together with the liberal atmosphere of the school, shifted his theology further leftward and he became a rational dissenter. Abhorring dogma and religious mysticism, rational dissenters emphasized the rational analysis of the natural world and the Bible. Priestley later wrote that the book that influenced him the most, save the Bible, was David Hartley's observations on man. Hartley's psychological, philosophical, and theological treatise postulated a material theory of mind. Hartley aimed to construct a Christian philosophy in which both religious and moral facts could be scientifically proven, a goal that would occupy Priestley for his entire life. In his third year at Daventry, Priestley committed himself to the ministry, which he described as the noblest of all professions, Needham Market and Nantwich. Robert Schofield, Priestley's major modern biographer, describes his first call, in 1755, to the dissenting parish in Needham Market, Suffolk, as a mistake for both Priestley and the congregation. Priestley yearned for urban life and theological debate, whereas Needham Market was a small, rural town with a congregation wedded to tradition. Attendance and donations dropped sharply when they discovered the extent of his heterodoxy. Although Priestley's aunt had promised her support if he became a minister, she refused any further assistance when she realized he was no longer a Calvinist. To earn extra money, Priestley proposed opening a school, but local families informed him that they would refuse to send their children. He also presented a series of scientific lectures titled, Use of the Globes, that was more successful. Priestley's Daventry friends helped him obtain another position, and in 1758 he moved to Nantwich, Cheshire, this time there was happier. The congregation cared less about Priestley's heterodoxy and he successfully established a school. Unlike many schoolmasters of the time, Priestley taught his students natural philosophy and even bought scientific instruments for them. Appalled at the quality of the available English grammar books, Priestley wrote his own, The Rudiments of English Grammar. His innovations in the description of English grammar, particularly his efforts to dissociate it from Latin grammar, led 20th century scholars to describe him as one of the great grammarians of his time. After the publication of Rudiments and the success of Priestley's school, Warrington Academy offered him a teaching position in 1761. Warrington Academy in 1761, Priestley moved to Warrington and assumed the post of tutor of modern languages and rhetoric at the town's dissenting academy. Although he would have preferred to teach mathematics and natural philosophy, he fitted in well at Warrington and made friends quickly. On 23 June 1762, he married Mary Wilkinson of Wrexham. Of his marriage, Priestley wrote, this proved a very suitable and happy connection, my wife being a woman of an excellent understanding, much improved by reading, of great fortitude and strength of mind, and of a temper in the highest degree affectionate and generous, feeling strongly for others, and little for herself, also, greatly excelling in everything relating to household affairs, she entirely relieved me of all concern of that kind which allowed me to give all my time to the prosecution of my studies and the other duties of my station. On the 17th of April 1763, they had a daughter, whom they named Sarah after Priestley's aunt. Educator and historian all of the books Priestley published while at Warrington emphasized the study of history, Priestley considered it essential for worldly success as well as religious growth. He wrote histories of science and Christianity in an effort to reveal the progress of humanity and, paradoxically, the loss of a pure, primitive Christianity. In his essay on a course of liberal education for civil and active life, lectures on history and general policy, and other works, Priestley argued that the education of the young should anticipate their future practical needs. This principle of utility guided his unconventional curricular choices for Warrington's aspiring middle-class students. He recommended modern languages instead of classical languages and modern rather than ancient history. 
Priestley's lectures on history were particularly revolutionary. He narrated a providentialist and naturalist account of history, arguing that the study of history furthered the comprehension of God's natural laws. Furthermore, his millennial perspective was closely tied to his optimism regarding scientific progress and the improvement of humanity. He believed that each age would improve upon the previous and that the study of history allowed people to perceive and to advance this progress. Some scholars of education have described Priestley as the most important English writer on education between the 17th century John Locke and the 19th century Herbert Spencer. Lectures on history was well received and was employed by many educational institutions, such as New College at Hackney, Brown, Princeton, Yale, and Cambridge. Priestley designed two charts to serve as visual study aids for his lectures. These charts are in fact timelines, they have been described as the most influential timelines published in the 18th century. Both were popular for decades, and the trustees of Warrington were so impressed with Priestley's lectures and charts that they arranged for the University of Edinburgh to grant him a Doctor of Law degree in 1764. History of Electricity The intellectually stimulating atmosphere of Warrington, often called the Athens of the North, during the 18th century, encouraged Priestley's growing interest in natural philosophy. He gave lectures on anatomy and performed experiments regarding temperature with another tutor at Warrington, his friend John Seddon. Despite Priestley's busy teaching schedule, he decided to write a history of electricity. Friends introduced him to the major experimenters in the field in Britain, John Canton, William Watson, and the visiting Benjamin Franklin, who encouraged Priestley to perform the experiments he wanted to include in his history. In the process of replicating others' experiments, Priestley became intrigued by unanswered questions and was prompted to undertake experiments of his own design. In 1767, the 700 page The History and Present State of Electricity was published to positive reviews. The first half of the text is a history of the study of electricity to 1766, the second and more influential half is a description of contemporary theories about electricity and suggestions for future research. Priestley reported some of his own discoveries in the second section, such as the conductivity of charcoal and other substances and the continuum between conductors and non-conductors. This discovery overturned what he described as one of the earliest and universally received maxims of electricity, that only water and metals could conduct electricity. This and other experiments on the electrical properties of materials and on the electrical effects of chemical transformations demonstrated Priestley's early and ongoing interest in the relationship between chemical substances and electricity. Based on experiments with charged spheres, Priestley was among the first to propose that electrical force followed an inverse square law, similar to Newton's law of universal gravitation. Priestley's strength as a natural philosopher was qualitative rather than quantitative in his observation of a current of real air between two electrified points would later interest Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell as they investigated electromagnetism. Priestley's text became the standard history of electricity for over a century. Alessandro Volta, William Herschel, and Henry Cavendish all relied upon it. Priestley wrote a popular version of the history of electricity for the general public titled A Familiar Introduction to the Study of Electricity. He marketed the book with his brother Timothy, but unsuccessfully.